Okay, guys, this is uh, Urbanization on um, Historical Time Thick. Remember, this is uh, the next to last time you'll see this. The first major corporations in the historical time period, six or in American history, were the railroads. Okay, railroad track mileage is uh, increasing exponentially from 1830 to 1910, and people can easily get pretty much anywhere they want in the country. The first mail order catalog is Matt Montgomery Ward, and then Sears comes uh, right about the same time. And basically, people can order just about anything they need, including an entire house. Uh, kind of prefab way back in those days, and chickens and bees and farm equipment and musical instruments, just anything they wanted, and they would throw these uh, items on a train, and uh, people could shop by catalog. And catalog uh, buying is going to be uh, throughout the West. So let's talk about the cities, okay? Uh, because all these immigrants are coming in, uh, factories are built, cities are going to be booming. And as part of these uh, city governments, we're going to see the advent of the political machine. And I know that many of you have probably talked about your civics classes. So a political machine can be a Democrat or Republican machine, and it's uh, found in the large cities. The most notorious of all the political machines, of course, is the Tweed Ring, located in New York City and headed by the famous Boss Tweed. Okay, so this is a Thomas Nast cartoon. You can see Tammany down here at the bottom, the Tammany Ring, because they worked out of Tammany Hall. And Boss Tweed, the uh, portly gentleman over here, to this is Boss Tweed, and you can see the caricature that Nast uh, uses for his political cartoons just kind of nails the way that Tweed looks. So this is the building. It's a, a museum now, and it is Tammany Hall, and this is where the political machine worked out of. They're going to be in existence for a long time, bilking the people of New York and to, until they just go too far. And this is called the Tweed Courthouse. It was supposed to call, cost the taxpayers about $250,000. It ends up costing millions because of kickbacks and bribes that are paid by the Tweed organization. And, of course, this is coming right out of the taxpayer's pocket. It is exposed, and even and that is too much. That is just too much. And uh, uh, Thomas Nast makes it his mission in life to bring down Boss Tweed. So he becomes Tweed's nemesis. And this is Thomas Nast. We've seen uh, Thomas Nast cartoons before, but probably what he is most famous for is his uh, his his political cartoons about the boss. So this is one, okay, and this is um, Boss Tweed leaning against the ballot box and saying, that's what's the matter. As long as I count the votes, what are you going to do about it, say? So what is this cartoon saying? If you answered that the Tweed ring pretty much had control of elections, and manipulated elections so their people were in political office, you were correct. This is one of Nast's more famous cartoons, and the caption here, of course, is a group of vultures waiting for the storm to blow over. Let us pray, P-R-E-Y. So I'm going to ask you to look at some of these symbols and tell me what this cartoon is representing. If you said that um, the vultures obviously are uh, feeding on the 
dead body here that has New York written on it. So they're preying on the people of New York, and you can see they've picked these bones clean. And uh, something to that effect that this, this Tammany Hall group has control and is killing off the people of New York and New York City. The city's had many problems, including a uh, water supply that could cause cholera in certain districts. And what we're going to talk about is what were the problems and what were the solutions. So, of course, housing, a major problem when you have millions of people coming into the cities, and what they did was build cheap, cheap, uh, high-rise buildings called tenements. And these were usually bare-bones apartments, and maybe they would have a bathroom on each floor. Maybe they would just uh, put the bathrooms in the basement, or maybe they would even have bas bathrooms outside. So a lot of these um, apartments didn't even have uh, the, the bare minimum uh, to keep, like, fresh water and so forth. Fresh water was a big deal because they'd been getting it from the river, and of course the river is where uh, everything was dumped, and that was bringing disease to these neighborhoods. So their solution is going to be aqueducts, and it's much like the old Roman Empire when they built aqueducts. It was, it's going to be done with uh, gravity, and they're going to connect to the Great Lakes um, up nor in northern New York and bring the water down to New York City. And then, of course, sanitation was a huge problem. People throwing their garbage out of windows, um, horses just defecating on the streets, dead animals. So New York City is going to implement a garbage collection service, and they are going to be dressed in white, and they are going to be cleaning the streets of New York and picking up garbage. So this is an example of New York tenements. You can see how close the buildings are to one another. I always think it's amazing. People are hanging their clothing out to dry. Some of them are, uh, they must have shimmied up the poles to, to tie these uh, lines. Some of them actually went from apartment building to apartment building. The crowded streets of New York, we talked about how they had no air conditioning, so a lot of the vendors would bring their goods out into the streets where people could buy. This is an example of uh, just the conditions. You can see how close people were to one another. These are shelters that were put up just right outside the city. And this is an example of an aqueduct. And you can see how big they are. Uh, those are people standing down below. And uh, the water is coming gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons. Think of all the water that people need just for the basic uh, necessities. We're, we're aware of that after losing our water here recently. So uh, this is, the, some of the aqueducts actually are still there, not in use now. Now the water does come to New York City from underground. So here's some more problems that they um, encountered. Transportation, and they are going to have uh, subway systems, elevated trains, streetcars will be put into effect, um, recreation to get kids, uh, they're, they're playing in the streets, so parks will be built, museums will be built, and then, of course, the uh, sanitation problem with rats and roaches, and that'll be solved with that garbage collection. This is the beautiful Central Park right smack in the middle of New York City. And it's uh, acres. It, it took years to create, but it still serves as a place that New Yorkers can go. This is an elevated train in Chicago. And you can see that they've got some horse-drawn uh, wagons underneath there, and as well as motorized vehicles. This is in Miami. This is a streetcar that's being pulled by a horse. They put rails down to make it easier for the horses to pull. Uh, if you go down to New Orleans, they still have these uh, streetcars in service down there. Uh, this is another example of a streetcar pulled by a horse drawn. So this is the original subway system. You can see it's got wooden uh, beams, and this is uh, in New York City. 
It was uh, a modern miracle. This is a picture of New York City pre 9 11, because you can see the Twin Towers there. See the uh, crowd. It's still got a huge um, harbor where items are brought in. And if you've never been to New York City, this is what a real city looks like. This is the first um, um, skyscraper. And it's it was the home insurance building in Chicago. Sadly, it was demolished. And now you've got a 60-story building there. This one was 10. Uh, Otis uh, invents a safe elevator system with an air brake and of course with the advent of cheaper steel buildings are going to go higher and higher. The Chrysler building is going to be built in New York City and this is an Art Deco building. You can see the beautiful arches there. It's considered one of the um, modern architecture uh, buildings and it was the tallest for a very short period of time because they were building the Empire State Building at the same time uh, that they were building the Chrysler. Because space is so valuable, uh, buildings took some funny shapes sometimes. These are called flat iron buildings. And this, of course, is the Empire State Building. It was the largest uh, tallest building for a long period of time. Uh, now it's been surpassed by several others. I think the tallest right now is uh, in Dubai. Uh, Donald Trump at one time actually owned the Empire State Building with a partner and he sold it off uh, in 2002. These are famous pictures by um, the photographer we had talked about, Lewis Hine, and you can see the Chrysler Building in the back. Just some more Lewis Hine pictures showing how dangerous it was to be part of the construction of this building. This one kind of makes me dizzy. Okay, a few more problems. Pollution, we're going to put into effect laws and regulations. Uh, police protection, fire departments and uh, police departments. There are going to be organizations to help the poor, including uh, settlement houses run by Jane Addams, uh, famous for Whole House in Chicago, and the reformers that will take pictures of uh, problems that hopefully will bring about solutions. City codes, laws, inspections, and we're going to talk about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. So the Triangle Shirt Waste Factory was an event that is going to lead to lots of um, regulations. It was a tragedy. This is the deadliest industrial fire. 146 women will die in this fire, most of them young, uh, most of them immigrants, and it was um, devastating. 50 women end up jumping from the ninth and 10th floor. The fire department came, but the ladders were not high enough and the fire escapes collapsed. The doors had been locked to keep the um, young women from going out and having a like cigarette break or to prevent stealing. It was um, just a, a disaster. Now this was a, a textile uh, factory. Most of these were uh, sewing seamstress. It, they were making um, shirts, dress shirts, and that was, uh, they were packed. And so they were up here on these higher floors and could not get out. People stood and couldn't do anything. Somebody said, why didn't you catch them? You cannot catch a hundred pounds falling from that kind of height uh, without killing yourself, basically. And it was, uh, they, they didn't have any of the resources like any kind of a net or anything. It, it happened so quickly. So the results of this horrible tragedy, uh, they're going to put fire codes in effect and uh, fire, fire escapes have to be in inspected uh, doors. If you notice, if you're uh, ever in a building 
that you can't get into, you can always get out of these kind of commercial buildings because you, the fire marshal says you've got to be able to escape. So doors can't be locked um, where they lock people in. Fire extinguishers are inspected and installed. You notice that uh, classrooms all have fire ex extinguisher. And if you check it, you can see that they have all been inspected. This is a fire escape, how it just kind of fell away from the building and was a mangled mess. And these are people trying to identify burned bodies. One of the problems, of course, was the poor and what kind of services do you give to the poor? Jane Adams uh, is going to establish settlement houses and a settlement house basically takes people in, they're established in the neighborhoods where the people are, and she is going to set this up. In it's kind of like uh, Providence House, if you're familiar, in Shreveport, and it provides job training, child care, uh, clothing. It, set, it sets you up uh, if you're, when you're going out into the world and just all sorts of services for the poor. And she is an amazing woman. We're going to see uh, her a lot. She's going to be, again, a conscientious objector to World War I and uh, just a really important woman. So make sure you remember Jane A. W. Adams. Jacob Rees is also going to be uh, working to try to improve conditions for the poor, and he does that by his photographs. And he is going to be uh, one of the very first to use flash photography. And he will go into these tenement buildings and these neighborhoods and take pictures. And then he uh, went around and had slideshows and took donations uh, to help conditions with the poor. Also, he advocated for them to get better conditions and uh, inspect on some of these areas that they worked. This is an apartment in one of the tenements, and you can see uh, they have many people sleeping in this one room, and uh, just it's just a bare bones. You see a wash uh, pan up there hanging up there, so they have to go out to get their water to uh, take care of their their washing needs. These are the bathrooms in some of those tenements. You had to go outside. Um, isn't that lovely? And you can imagine the rats and the um, bugs and the filth that uh, was, ooh, it just it kind of gives you the, the icks. <laughs> okay. And then you contrast that with the wealth, the uh, penthouses. So these are two buildings, and you can see we have uh, two penthouses here on top. Each one of them has a pool, and uh, this is in New York City. Probably cost a fortune. One of the uh, engineering feats of the world was the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. And people were coming into uh, the city, and they were having to ferry across, and so a bridge was necessary. And in order to do that, to go across the river, sunk these huge, huge boxes. They made they were called caissons, and you can see uh, the rendering here. They were like almost a city block long, and they would sink them down into the river and then take, you think of a, a glass that you turn upside down and you put into water and it traps air. Then they would have this air vent and the air vent would be used to, of course, uh, provide air for the workers underneath as they took out the floor and dug down to the bedrock. And they would, uh, as they dug down to the bedrock, the caisson would sink and you can see they're uh, digging and uh, um, here on the left and then pouring the sediment out. Um, then this is going to be filled with concrete and this is going to be the base for the bridge. 
Well, after you're down for a certain number of hours, the air gets stale and people actually died from, it's kind of like the bends in diving from this lack of um, oxygen and basically you cramp to death and very, very painful, painful death. But ultimately the bridge is going to be completed. It's still um, going strong today and it's uh, got a walking area and something like 100,000 cars a day go across this bridge.